Hello people, Zach here again today, and today I'm going to be talking about a, uh, a subject that I covered a couple of weeks ago in a video entitled on the non-existence of the electron particle. Um, I guess it's more like an extension to the subject. It's related in a sense because of what it is that's being defined. Uh, in that particular video, I didn't so much disprove the existence of the electron particle. The, that wasn't my goal. What I was trying to do is I was I was attacking the definitions that were being used because they're illogical at the moment and they have no basis in reality anymore. They basically they they choose these constants and then they say that the constants are the thing. And like that's it's retarded because there really are no constants in nature. There's just relationships. Everything is relative. But anyway, um, the way that I did that video, I talked about the entire history of how it was discovered, the logic that led to it, um, beginning with the work of Michael Faraday, following by George Johnstone Stoney, then by J.J. Thompson, uh, his student Ernest Rutherford, his relationship with uh, George Francis Fitzgerald, uh, the work of his son, uh, G.P. Thompson. Now, in this particular video, though, I'm not talking about electrons in particular, uh, but what I am talking about is a problem that I discovered in uh, the foundations of quantum mechanics that is absolutely huge. Um, because of where it's at, uh, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that this could affect everything from the way that we define elements in the periodic table uh, to SPDF orbitals to... Um, to like the Sepper theory, to quantum mechanics, like it, it, it hits everything because of where it's at. Uh, and the reason why I don't think that many people have noticed this is because it sits at an intersection between many different interconnected topics. So like if you don't fully understand the definitions and the relationships between equivalents, molar masses, combining powers, and velocities, atomic weights, subatomic particles, the Faraday constant, Faraday's law of electrolysis, the ideal gas law, and Avogadro's number, you probably won't see it. Um, so that's I want to do this video from the perspective that like if you don't know anything about chemistry or anything about particle physics that you should be able to follow along. Um, so I'm going to be... Um, doing a lot of defi definitions, uh, beginning with even what an atom is. So the different elements that are in the, um, the periodic table, they're all defined by the number of protons that they have. Um, hydrogen is defined as having one proton. Now, note that is a uh, definition, that is not an observation. It is defined as having one proton. Now a proton is defined as having a plus one charge. So in order for it to be neutrally charged, you have to cancel that out. And so it has to have one electron to balance out the proton. Uh, now atoms can also have isotopes because inside their nucleus are not just protons, but also uh, neutrons. And the isotope is identified by the number of uh, protons and neutrons that it has. So take for example, carbon-12. Carbon-12, um, 12 identifies the isotope, which is like the, uh, the atomic mass, um, and 6 is the actual number of protons that defines what the element is. Now, um, as we know, atoms are able to bond in one of two ways. They can bond in covalent bonds, which is where their valence electrons uh, kind of share orbitals, and uh, so they share electrons. Uh, but there's also ionic bonds, which is where one uh, atom will either uh, donate electron that gets accepted by another, or um, it might become ionized, which is where the atom is just stripped away. And uh, in both of these cases, uh, you have two different types of ions. You have, um, when a particle loses a, uh, an electron, it has a net positive charge, and so we call that a cation. And when it gains an electron, it has a net negative charge, so it becomes an anion. And um, as far as hydrogen is concerned, hydrogen has several different isotopes. Uh, the most common ones are like tritium, deuterium, and protium. Um, deuterium has one proton and uh, one neutron, so it's a hydrogen 2 atom. The protium has no neutrons, so it's just a proton and an electron. And if you ionize protium, which means you um, turn it into a cadmium where you take away one electron, what you end up with is basically just a proton. So a proton is an ionized isotope of hydrogen. And uh, hydrogen ions are also called hadrons. So if you've 
heard of like large hydron collider or large hadron colliders um that's what that is they're they're shooting high, uh, ionized hydrogen at each other and all elements are just compounds of hydrogen so and we covered all of that let's move on to the next thing uh, atomic weights like how the weights are defined um all weights are relative to the weight of carbon 12. carbon 12 is defined as have uh as 12 daltons um so what that means is like there's in one gram of carbon 12 there is exactly 12 daltons or another way of looking at it is that one dalton is equal to one twelfth of a, a gram of uh, carbon 12. Now, um, carbon-12, as I mentioned earlier, uh, has six protons and six neutrons. Now, the interesting thing about Daltons as well is that they can be used to measure molecules, not just the weights of atoms. And the average atomic mass of a molecule in Daltons is equal to the number of grams in one mole of that substance. Uh, so, for example, H2O. H2O has two hydrogens and uh, one oxygen. Uh, hydrogen has an atomic weight, an average atomic weight of 1.008 Daltons, and oxygen has an average atomic weight of 0, sorry, 15.997 Daltons. So if you do 1.008 plus 1.008 plus 15.997, what you get is 18.013 Daltons. Um, so that is the average uh, atomic weight of a molecule. Now, the other interesting thing about this as well is because of the way that Daltons are defined, this also means that uh, one mole of H2O weighs 18.013 Daltons. I mean, I mean weighs 18.013 grams. The number of um, the number of Daltons is uh, in one mole of a substance is equal to the number of grams in one mole. So let's go on to the next thing, uh, equivalent weights. The equivalent in moles is the amount of a substance that reacts with another substance in a chemical reaction. Now there's two main types of chemical reactions for which this is defined. Um, you have your acid-base reactions, which is where there's an exchange of protons, and then you have your redox reactions where there's an exchange of electrons. But the, the formal equivalent, like we're talking about the, a very specific type of equivalent that we use in our mathematics, uh, is based off of monovalence, um, which basically means like um, protons or uh, protein H plus, H plus ions or uh, electrons. So... Uh, and the equivalent weight is the ratio of the molar mass to the equivalent. So, which is to say that, I mean, that this number is also equal to the atomic weight, I mean, the ratio of the atomic weight to the valence, um, because of the relationship that there is between uh, molar mass and Daltons, for like atomic weights. So now we're finally at the, uh, the core issues here. I'm sorry, it's been a lot long-winded, but here we are. Uh, Faraday's law of electrolysis. So Faraday made the observation that the amount of substance that's deposited at an, an electrode during an electrolytic experiment is directly proportional to the quantity of applied charge. Um, and he also noted that it's also equivalent to, I mean, it's proportional to the equivalent weight um, which again is the molar mass over the combining power of valency. Um, now what this means is that the ratio of the, uh, the amount of substance deposited at the electrode to the charge is equal to um, the equivalent weight over Far a constant, which is called Faraday's constant. And uh, Faraday's constant, this is the actual problem here. Uh, Faraday's constant, which is what we use to define the electron volt, it's equal to the electron volt times Avogadro's number. And the problem here is that Avogadro's number um, was originally defined by moles. So like if you know what a carbon-12 is, you know the mole is based on carbon-12, and Avogadro's number can be defined in moles. Now, But prior to that, 
prior to defining it on based on moles, we used to base it off of something called the ideal gas law. And of course, the ideal gas law is PV equals nRT. Um, so there's a uh, there's a solution that you can do where if you know the temperature and the pressure um, accurately, and you have like a particular R value, um, and you know the volume, you can determine how many uh, molecules of a substance that there are in a gas. Uh, so that's how they originally defined Avogadro's number. Now, the problem where this connects in with Faraday's constant is that there is no reason to believe whatsoever that something like an electron should be able to abide by the ideal gas law because what they're looking at is the charge per mole of electrons. Uh, so it's like Q over... Uh, molar mass. To reiterate, there, there's no reason to believe whatsoever that the charge per mole of electrons um, should abide by the ideal gas law. Like what? Like the number of electrons in a mole. There's no reason to believe that the number of electrons in a mole um, should be that. Because they're not affected by temperature, uh, there's the uh, they don't have R values. They they took a constant that we normally use for intermolecular forces um, and tried to apply that to electrons. And so, like I said, like this is the definition of Faraday's constant, which is the basis upon which the electrovolts are defined. So once you hit this, you've hit everything above it. You've hit like SPDF orbitals, Vesper theory, um, crap, like some periodic tables, the way that they define like electron configurations. There's no telling how far this goes. Um, and it may be the case that maybe they've redefined something because these standards committees, since they've came out, they keep getting less and less physical rather than saying like it is this, it's based off of this physical thing. They keep becoming more and more mathematical where they just define like some fixed number at one point in time, which may not have even been accurately measured. And, um, uh, saying that, I mean, just saying that, because like, in my opinion, there's no such thing as a constant in nature. Everything is relative. And so the second you start naming constants, you're already creating problems. Uh, and this even applies to like Avogadro's number. Like Avogadro's number is based off of a particular condition uh, that applies to ideal gases. Uh, there's no reason to believe that it should apply to electrons as well. And uh, I just wanted to cover that because I thought that was a huge deal. And... Um, Anyways, if you have any comments, uh, leave them down below. I'll respond to you when I can. Um, thank you for watching.